Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. I'm not sure if you've ever thought about algorithms, but after listening to this podcast, you'll never think of them the same way again. Dr. Khadija Ferryman is an assistant professor and core faculty at the Berman Institute of Bioethics at Johns Hopkins. She speaks with Dr. Josh Sharstein about the algorithms all around us and how the risk of bias in these algorithms poses a risk to our health. Let's listen. Dr. Khadija Ferryman, thanks for joining me on Public Health On Call. Now, usually when we talk about potentially dangerous, unseen challenges to public health, we're talking about microorganisms or viruses. But today we're going to talk about algorithms. Let's start with basic question. What's an algorithm? I think a great way to think about what an algorithm is, is to think about it as a recipe. A recipe is a set of instructions, right? So if you're going to make dinner, uh, you know, you you look at all of your different ingredients that you need. So there's a list of ingredients and then there's the steps of sort of what you need to do. And that in a way is sort of, you know, akin to what algorithms are. So there are sets of ingredients, which we think of as data um, that we need to make the algorithm run. And then there are a set of instructions, right? So there are a set of instructions that tell the computer, in this case, not the person making dinner, but tell the computer what to do with the ingredients, what to do with the data. So um, that's one way I think we can think about algorithms in a way that I think, you know, we all can understand. And so let's talk about those recipes or algorithms that are all around us? And how did they affect our lives? Could you give some examples? Yeah, so algorithms are everywhere. I think that's not an overstatement to say that. So um, again, just thinking of everyday examples, if you um, use any streaming services like Netflix, there are algorithms there that, again, take data or information or ingredients which are the shows that you've watched before. And then there are a set of instructions. Now, I don't know Netflix's algorithms. Those are proprietary, but we can infer from what we see that, you know, Netflix's algorithms work by taking uh, the information of what we watch and then ranking those or showing us things that are similar to the things that we've watched before, right? So things that it shows us things we might like um, based on what we've watched before. So the sort of steps are look at this, show, see how long the person's watched it, what kind of characters there are, look at other shows that have similar kinds of characters, similar kinds of settings, and show this, you know, a similar, five similar things to this person, because they'll probably watch that too. So that's an example of an algorithm. Um, There are algorithms in online, you know, shopping that do the same thing, that sort of recommend um, if you search for something on, let's say, Amazon, right, there are algorithms kind of happening in the background to show you, uh, to sort of sort the things that you might be interested in, or even after you buy something to show you something else that you might be interested in as well. And even Google search uh, operates using algorithms that try to sort of sort information and present information to the user. The algorithms in the background sort of determined um, will be relevant to you. So there are also algorithms that affect our health. Could you give some examples? I think that For example, there's software that recommends to doctors what might be appropriate treatment for their patients. Absolutely. So just like with the Netflix example of sort of recommending things that you might like, in healthcare settings more um, frequently, there are algorithms that are recommending to, as you said, to physicians and and nurses and other kinds of clinicians, sort of um, treatments that they should offer to patients, tests that they should run based on the information about that patient. So yes, there are um, algorithms that sort of recommend screening and, and treatment for 
uh, patients. There's also algorithms used in the healthcare space that are used for things like administrative functions, like scheduling appointments and when and and what times. Um, there's also algorithms being used in the healthcare space to try to look at, let's say, drugs that are being developed and try to see if there are other new ways that those um, ingredients in a particular drug could be used for another set of conditions, right? Um, so again, using uh, data that we increasingly find in digitized formats in healthcare to say, okay, this drug is marketed for this disease, but we've seen that it's, you know, used and had some success for something else. Can we use algorithms to help sort of recommend other ways that this drug could be used? So algorithms are used in medicine and healthcare in a, in a variety of ways. How do algorithms relate to AI, artificial intelligence? So algorithms can be very simple or they can be very complex. So you can have an algorithm that just has, let's say, three steps, three parts of the recipe, three rules to follow, or you can have an algorithm that has hundreds and millions of um, steps or rules to follow. Or you can also have algorithms where they uh, start with a few rules and then begin to generate some of the rules themselves. And that's where the difference between what we might think of as simple algorithms and artificial intelligence algorithms, how we can think about that difference. Artificial intelligence algorithms are very complex algorithms that um, include many, many rules and in some cases can essentially write some of the rules themselves of their programming. I guess this may go without saying, but just like it's kind of hard to know exactly what's in the Netflix model, some of these algorithms and their use in healthcare, it's not exactly clear what all those recipes are, like exactly how the recommendations are being made. Exactly. And I think that's where some of the concern around algorithms um, in the healthcare space comes up. There's this notion that's used to describe algorithms, not just in healthcare, but algorithms in general as being black boxed, meaning that we um, users or uh, people on whom the algorithms are used can't sort of know which pieces of information are being used to make recommendations, how different pieces of information are being weighted, which information is included, which information is excluded. So there's this sort of opacity around how these algorithms work. Um, and so for clinicians, even though some some of these algorithms can be very useful, again, in sort of flagging, making recommendations for uh, tests that could be done for a patient or treatment uh, modalities that maybe they haven't considered, right? There's obviously um, great potential, but there is some concern from clinicians about like, okay, well, where where is this recommendation coming from and how do I know that I can really trust this recommendation? With the consequences a lot more serious than what TV shows will be recommended to you. <laughs> right, right. Um, I mean, depending on how, uh, you know, how much you take your, you know, TV watching seriously, but no, um, that that's the other concern, right? That because we're talking about treatments, because we're talking about screening, if there is less um, knowledge about these recommendation tools, it's a little bit more concerning in the in the healthcare space, and even also, sort of, I, I mentioned the administrative uses of algorithms in healthcare. There are ways that algorithms are being used by insurance companies, for example, to make recommendations about who could or could not receive extra healthcare resources, for example, who may be getting sicker in the future. And, you know, that is also of concern outside of the, you know, direct medical practice. There's also domains within healthcare, again, in, in sort of the health insurance agency, where there's some concern about how these algorithms are working, what kinds of recommendations they are making, what data they're using, what's being included and excluded. And then, you know, in, in the case of uh, health insurance companies, for example, right, how do users or those subject to those decisions, uh, how much agency do they have? and sort of knowing how these decisions sort of came about. Now, you and some colleagues have recently written about one example of an algorithm um, that is used pretty widely when people come in to the emergency room, for example, for pain. Yes. So we recently wrote about the NARC score, which is a risk score that's used to um, be able to assess an individual's risk 
for opioid misuse. And obviously, in the context of, of opioid misuse that has come to light in the public eye over the last number of years, right, this is an important issue to address. However, what we wrote about is kind of going back to that analogy of the recipe and the ingredients we raise questions around, well, what are the data points that are used to uh, develop this risk score and to, to develop this algorithm? And could some of those data points be unintentionally making that algorithm biased against certain groups? Because many algorithms, as I mentioned before, are proprietary. We don't know the exact sort of formulation of the NARC score, but based on other evidence that we've gathered, a data point like criminality is one that is, you know, likely to be included in this kind of score, which um, there's racial bias embedded in something like criminal history because of histories of over-policing in, in certain communities, for example. So um, this is an example we wrote about sort of wanting to be cautious about a tool that I think most people would say it sounds at the surface very necessary and, and could be helpful, but could have biases um, embedded within. In other words, someone comes to the doctor with pain. On its surface, it seems reasonable to assess their risk for addiction. But if that risk number actually is based on a whole set of factors that may be biased, then the consequence could be that patients in certain groups are maybe even denied pain medicine or at least um, restricted in what they can access and not really aware of what's going on. Exactly. And it gets back to the point that you raised before about black box algorithms in in a scenario where someone would be denied treatment for their pain. Often, again, because of the black box nature of algorithms, their clinician maybe would not know the, the reasons behind the, the NARC score that they had received and the um, patient may not know sort of how the algorithm determined them to be at the risk level that they were, right? So even this is part of why algorithmic bias is so concerning is that in, in some cases it can, you know, have harmful effects on individuals, but then sort of trying to figure out where the cause of that harm um, in some cases can be difficult as well. And so you could have algorithms that make it harder for people in certain groups, particularly people of color, to be eligible for certain kinds of therapies that may be life-saving and you go, well, why is that algorithm saying that? And you can't really answer that question exactly because it may not be that well-known or why it's an insurance company not making a certain service available to people and the algorithm isn't transparent. You don't know why there's a group that's not getting that. And so this is an area that is perhaps even less explored than algorithms themselves. Right. Yeah. And, you know, going back to the pain example, right? So thinking about a scenario where some of the ingredients to that algorithm may have biases embedded in there that result in a, a particular individual being denied care, but a pattern of certain groups being denied pain care is harmful. But what we're also seeing in these cases that even though the algorithms are black box and we may not know the exact reasons why the algorithm is making the decisions that it is, what we are seeing, the pattern that's also emerging is that the patterns of disenfranchisement, of uh, differential treatment are repeating historical patterns of disparity. So for example, in pain, there's before the you know use of something like a NARC score, there's already research showing that Black patients, for example, are denied certain pain medications more often than white patients, for example. And then with the introduction of algorithms, we see an amplification of already existing uh, patterns of health inequity. So that's the other concerning piece, right? It's that the algorithms sort of act in a certain way, but then they're also amplifying inequities that already exist. That is an important topic and one that has to be confronted. What, what do you think um, can be done to address bias and algorithms? Yeah, so there's um, there's no easy answer to this question, of course, but one main uh, strategy is around transparency, right? So trying to sort of open up that black box and try to get a sense of, okay, what data points are these algorithms using? How are they making these decisions? What data points are being weighed? Is there a role for regulation of algorithms? 
specifically when we're thinking about healthcare and the practice of medicine, um, there is a, a regulator, there's an agency that's responsible for regulating medical algorithms and medical art, artificial intelligence, and that's the Food and Drug Administration. And that's because the Food and Drug Administration has historically been responsible for regulating medical devices like scalpels or things like that, right, that are used in medical care. And as medical algorithms and medical AIs become more complex, in some cases, they can really function as medical devices. And so the FDA has already been reviewing uh, applications and, and has cleared and approved many medical algorithms already. And this is an, a, a sort of evolving space for the agency. And since 2019, they have sort of asked for public comments and, and public input on how do we actually govern? How do we regulate these uh, kinds of tools, particularly because uh, AI tools can change in the sense that they can write some of their own rules when an agency approves a medical AI, if it is a learning medical AI, it can sort of change its function. How does the agency deal with that, right? They approve sort of one version of something, but if it changes when it's being used, how do they deal with that? So there are a lot of interesting regulation sort of policy questions that come up in this space. I think one that's really important to consider is what we've been talking about is identifying harms uh, that emerge between uh, different groups due to the use of medical Medical AI, thinking about health equity, this is something that the agency has pledged to address in their sort of next round of developing uh, policy and regulation in this space. The FDA only really regulates uh, medical AIs that function as medical devices. And that's just one category within the bigger group of algorithms that are used in healthcare. So for example, if a hospital um, has a group of, you know, clinicians or others who develop a medical algorithm or a, a medical AI tool for their patients and they're not planning to use it in, you know, any other institutions just in their hospital, that kind of algorithm wouldn't necessarily come under the FDA's regulation. So there's also a space for uh, institutions themselves to uh, play a regulatory role in the use of these algorithms, even if they're not going to be leaving the walls of one particular hospital, as it were. In theory, could well-designed algorithms help to address questions of bias? Absolutely. And there's a great paper that some um, computer scientist colleagues of mine wrote that's uh, called Treating Health Disparities with Artificial Intelligence, right? And it's this idea that artificial intelligence tools are really good at certain things. They're really good at detecting patterns in information that you give them. It's really good at detecting patterns in data. And so what we are seeing now in some of the cases that we've been talking about algorithms detect patterns like bias, like, uh, you know, histories of policing in black and brown communities, right? If that's a, an ingredient in that recipe, the algorithm is really good at identifying that there's a kind of difference in that data and working that into the way it sort of designs its recipe, right? But in that case, those can have harmful outcomes and that can be a bias. But if we know that algorithms are really good and artificial intelligence tools are really good at spotting patterns in data, then we can actually use algorithms to look at the data that we have to say, okay, well, where are these different patterns? Where do we see uh, differences between groups in treatment, in testing, um, in access to healthcare, right? And if we can actually use AI in some cases as sort of like a hypothesis generating tool, right? Or, or a way to sort of uh, use those tools to look at the biases that we that exist in in the data um, to help sort of tell us about some of the inequities that we already know exist in healthcare. And this can just be, you know, using another set of methodologies to highlight and really shed light on some of those um, disparities that we see in healthcare. Dr. Perryman, thank you so much for opening my eyes to many of these issues, I'm sure, um, opening the eyes of many of our listeners too, and uh, really appreciate your work. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran.
Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.